Good morning to good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to our weekly Tuesday Chapel at Carolina College of Biblical Studies. We have some very distinguished preview day guests amongst us. <laughs> Students, please smile. <laughs> you are happy. You are happy. Uh, st staff members, smile. You're glad to work here. <laughs> We really do enjoy being here, so in case you're wondering. This will be the final President's Chapel of our semester, so we're looking forward to Dr. Corver sharing from the Word. Before that, um, we're going to enjoy a time of worship and music led by two distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Hovader and Mr. Probus. Distinguished. Thank you for being here and just for your loving, joyful spirit. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your spirit amongst us. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, the purpose that draws us together. Use this time in a special way as we uh, seek to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that amongst our school family there would be some heavy burdens in addition to the responsibility of seeking to finish the semester well we pray that you might answer prayer meet every need in a timely way as we depend completely upon you and now in demonstration of our love and dependency we want to exalt jesus and sing these praises from our heart to glorify your most precious name. Thank you for Dr. Corver. And as he opens the word, may Lord, he have the assurance that we desire to hear from you, that he might have complete liberty uh, to preach your word this morning. And we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you'll stand this morning, we'll be singing, I love you, Lord. And stand up here. Stand Yep. <laughs> Listen, if I stood up, it would be out of revival. It's coming. The day is coming, David. <laughs> <It's coming. laughs>
Are we good? Yeah. Okay. To you, sir. Well, welcome to our preview day attendees. If you don't know this, you probably wouldn't. In chapel this uh, semester, I speak the first Thursday of the month, and the other faculty members do the other uh, Thursday, excuse me, Tuesdays. <laughs> speak Thursdays, but not in chapel. Anyway, Tuesdays. And they've been going through the fruit of the Spirit. I've been doing something different, and they've been doing the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> well, about a week ago, Dr. Dickerson came to me and he said, hey, what do you plan on speaking on next week? And I mentioned a different passage, and uh, it's related to the Spirit of God's ministry in our life. And he said, do you realize somehow in the whole planning of this thing we skipped patience? And now I didn't realize we skipped patience. And somebody who needs more of it said, we really would like you to talk about patience. Okay. By the way, every last person in this room needs more patience, okay? So today we're going to be looking at the concept of patience. So many start the verse, as in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, like this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc., etc., etc. If you don't know about public speaking, you say etc. when you run out of things to say. <laughs> or something like this. Uh, we could go on for hours. That's a minister's way of saying, I've run out of things to say, but I really could go on for, you know, whatever. The last six parts of the fruit of the Spirit, I think often get second class status, because we, we all say fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and then we kind of like, we just die out there. Well, the fourth on the list of nine is patience. You know, there's an old saying, patience is a virtue. But here's the problem, it's not a virtue that comes naturally to anybody. Uh, have you ever prayed what somebody called the American prayer? Here's what the American prayer is. Lord, give me patience, and Lord, I want it now. Okay. Someone else has said it's better to be, a pa to be patient on the road than be a patient in the hospital. <laughs> Impatience has ruined many a relationship, some fatally. We get impatient, and when we do that, we uh, say and do things that really can hinder a relationship. One author said this, quote, wouldn't you rather do anything than wait? If the truth were known, some of us would rather do the wrong thing than wait. You know, if we're waiting on God and we know we, we should continue to wait on God, sometimes we just shift in gear and we just do something because we're tired of waiting. We want to lose weight. There you go. <laughs> so I hope to ask and answer three questions today. One, why do we need patience? Secondly, what kind of patience is God's patience? Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. And then lastly, how, how do I get that patience? Okay? So if you would, open your Bible or your device to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to actually be in a few places this morning, but we'll get to that one in just a few minutes. So why do we need patience? It may be somewhat self-obvious, but here's the first idea. Because it's not our natural response to life situations. By the way, full disclosure here, I didn't have to look long or hard for illustrations for impatience. <laughs> You're at a light, pick your road, Rayford Road, Skybo, any, any place you want to be. You're at a light. It's a red light. The light turns green and the driver ahead of you is on the phone. It takes me about a nanosecond to think, oh, come on already, right? Don't laugh like this doesn't happen to you. <laughs> you're in line at the bank, and you've got your deposit slip filled out, whether you're in the drive-thru or not, and the person ahead of you has no clue. They're fumbling through their wallet purse, asking the teller, can I get a, a deposit ticket? You're thinking, oh, come on, just go to the back of the line. I'm ready, right? If you're married, your spouse is getting ready for church or a special service a night somewhere and you've been ready for 15 minutes. <sighs> they call these places lots of us eat fast food restaurants. And you go to said restaurant, I admit, pet peeve of mine, 
and I order whatever, which the meal includes, the combo number three, whatever includes fries, and they say, we don't have any fries, we'll drop them, they'll be ready in seven minutes. I'm thinking, when do you think you'd be selling fries? This is lunchtime. <laughs> It's not our natural response to be patient. Would you agree to that? Yeah. Okay. But far more important than that, uh, our impatience is a telling witness to others about our faith in Christ. One of my favorite uh, writers, a mentor from long ago, wrote this in his book, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life. It's a little lengthy of a quote, but let me read it to you. <clears throat> The airliner was an hour and a half late. People are grumpy, some are downright mad. Stewardesses are apologizing, promising extra booze to take the edge off. To complicate matters, the Japanese man across the aisle from me has a rather severe nosebleed and he's trying to, and they're trying to instruct the poor chap. Problem is he doesn't speak English. So now the meal is late. The lady on my left has a cold and makes an enormous sound when she sneezes. About every 90 seconds I've timed her. It's something like a, di like a dying calf in a hailstorm or a bull moose with one, one leg in a trap. <laughs> oh, one more thing. The sports film on golf just broke down, so, and so did the nervous system of half the men on board. It's a zoo. It all started with the delay, mechanical trouble, they said. Inexcusable, responded a couple of passengers. Frankly, I'd rather they fix it before we decided to take off, but... <laughs> We Americans don't like to wait. Delays are irritating, aggravating, nerve-jangling. With impatient predictability, we are consistently, and might I add, obnoxiously demanding. We want what we want, and we want it now. No one, not a one of us, finds delay easy to accept. Do you question that? Put yourself in these situations. You're in the grocery store. Busy evening ahead, long lines, shopping cart has a wheel that drags. You know those floppy wheels, right? Yep. You finally finish, choose the stall, the line ahead, or only two ahead of you. The checker is new on the job. Her hands tremble, beads of perspiration dot her brow. Slowly she gets to you. Her cash register tape runs out. She's not sure how to change it. Watch out. Mm. <laughs> it's dinner out with family night, that special place. You fasted most of the day so you can gorge tonight. Given a booth, a menu, but the place is terribly busy, and there are two waitresses short. So you're there, there you sit, hungry as a buffalo in winter, with a glass of water and a menu you've begun to gnaw on. You're delayed. What's your response? You're a little late to work. Freeway is full, so you slip through traffic using a barely known shortcut only Daniel Boone could have figured out. You hit all the green lights as you slide around trucks and slow drivers. Just about the time you feel foxy, an ominous clang, clang, clang strikes your ears. A train. <laughs> the rubber of Christianity meets the road of proof at such intersections in life. As the expression goes, our faith is fleshed out at times like that. The best test of my Christian growth occurs in the mainstream of life, not in the quietness of my study. Anybody can walk in victory when surrounded by books, silence, warm waves of sunshine splashing through the window. But those late takeoffs, grocery lines, busy restaurant, trains, that's where faith is flushed out. And here's the great kind of bottom line, Chuck's quote. The stewardess on the plane could care less that I'm a pre-tribulational rapturist. <laughs> Your waitress will not likely be impressed that you can prove the authorship of the Pentateuch. Nor will the gal at the checkout stand stare in awe as you inform her of the distinctive characteristics of biblical infallibility which you embrace. <laughs> One quality, however, a single rare virtue, scarce as diamonds and twice as precious, will immediately attract them to you and soften their spirits. That quality? The ability to accept delay graciously. When we are patient... So hopefully you understand the need for it. The problem is, <laughs> what is it and how do we get it? Mm -hmm. Well, so we need it because it's not a natural response, mm -hmm. and it really does go a long way in either helping our witness or destroying our witness. Mm -hmm. So what in the world is this spirit-given patience? Well, here's what it's not. Before I tell you what it is, here's what it's not. It's not clenched teeth. You've been there, right? 
you know you shouldn't say anything just like you might break like a crown off in your mouth and, mm, it's not a slow burn it's not even just enduring because you have to webster defines patience as follows the bearing of provocation annoyance misfortune without complaint loss of temper or irritation that's webster we realize uh, we don't follow Daniel Webster around here, right? We, so what does the scripture say? Well, the scripture word that we often use the word long-suffering or slow to anger, some of your budding Greek scholars, macrothumia, okay? Macro, remember, micro means what? Macro is big, okay, so long or big, so long, and then the thumia, like thermometer or suffering or heat, okay? So think of it this way, you'd rather have a, quick thermometer heats up like that, you got a long thermometer. Or back in my day, we used to throw a lot of firecrackers. You all know what, if you're under 40, you even know what a firecracker is? Okay. <laughs> and so they had a fuse on them, right? And so the way you describe somebody who was really quick to anger, you'd say he, he or she has a short fuse. I've done this before. Throw all these firecrackers to your arms about sore, and then you pick up the duds. The duds are the ones that the fuse died. And so I remember saying to my friend Jimmy Ellison, I'll throw it, you light it. And so, you know, I've got my arm cocked and he lit it and I got about right here. <laughs> it hurts. That's a short fuse. Nobody ever said I was the sharpest knife in the drawer. Okay. My wife's over there thinking, man alive, why'd I marry this guy? So often translated long-suffering in the old King James, some of the newer translations, slow to anger. So the same word is used, we're going to look at in just a second, in Romans 2, 4, don't go there, of God's patience toward us to bring us to salvation and God's patience toward us to bring us to sanctification in the process, Romans 2, 4. Uh, listen to the words of Paul in 1 Timothy one. By the way, we're going to get to 1 Thessalonians in just a second, so hang on. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Paul's talking about God's patience with him. And here's what Paul, and his, you know Paul's story about how he came to faith, right? Here's what Paul says, 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. For this reason I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Perfect patience. Wow. We don't know Paul's age, but he was probably in his 30s at least. And he'd been imprisoning believers and doing all sorts of things. And God, Paul says, you know, I thank God for his great patience to keep working with me until he got me to that Damascus Road experience. God's patience is long-suffering. No, it's just not God. You realize in ministry, you need patience. Y'all know that? Listen to the words of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Paul, writing to Timothy, this young pastor that, he's, that he has mentored, says this. Preach the word. Now, you heard that in homiletics plenty of times, right? Yeah. Preach the word. Okay, then he says, be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience. Here's a, here's, a, here's a spoiler alert. You can preach a great sermon. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be instantly changed. <laughs> okay? It takes great patience to keep on pastoring, keep on shepherding, keep on mentoring, keep on whatever God's called you to do because people don't just suddenly change. They could. They ought to. By the way, it's not just that they don't. We don't either if we're just going to be real honest. Great patience. Chrysostom, the early church father, said this, the spirit that could take revenge if it, if it liked, but utterly refuses to. That's the idea of patience. Could take revenge, so I'm not going to go there. One theological dictionary talking about the word patience in the positive sense says, says it this way, it expresses persistence or an, or an unswerving willingness to await events rather than to try to force them. You know what it's like when you try to force something? All of us can force things. Let me just give you a quick example. You ever been in a place financially where you were, things were a little tight and you were asking God to do something and God hadn't done it yet? 
Well, you know, they have these things in your back wall, in your wallet or in your purse called credit cards. Oh, yeah. And so rather than stop waiting on God, you just, <laughs> I can fix that. You just swipe, right? Because you're just tired of waiting. You're like, God, come on. And he's not coming on. So you're like, okay, I'll fix that. That's a spirit of impatience. Now you're in 1 Thessalonians 5, yes? Yes. Verse 14. Paul says this to the church at Thessalonica. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and don't you wish this last line wasn't in your Bible? Be patient with your friends. <laughs> nah. Be patient with all men. By the way, ladies, don't elbow somebody next to that. doesn't mean males. That means all people. Okay? So let's go through that list of men. So he says, to, to uh, admonish the unruly. The word unruly there means somebody who's out of rank. Some of you are soldiers or former soldiers, military folks, right? It's kind of using the military sense to be somebody who's insubordinate. Okay? That doesn't mean just military people. But just somebody who's kind of out of line. They're kind of pulling rank or whatever they're doing. So you admonish them. They need to be admonished. And he says about those who are next to you, said, encourage the faint-hearted. The word faint-hearted here literally means small or short-souled. Small or short-souled. What in the world does that mean? Well, in the Septuagint, remember the first translation of the Bible, Hebrew to Greek Old Testament, Proverbs 18, 14, uses the term broken spirit. Encourage those who are broken in spirit. Isaiah 51, 15, Septuagint again, translates it lowly spirit. So broken in spirit, those who are lowly in spirit. In other words, it's those who've been mistreated. They're broken spirited, broken hearted. Those who, are, who waver in confidence. And what does he say you're supposed to do to those? Well, you're supposed to encourage them. Now, just think about somebody who might fit that category. So those first two, the unruly or the faint-hearted, broken in spirit, They've, life's been tough on them, whatever. Have you noticed that you can try to correct the insubordinate or encourage the, the faint-hearted, and they don't always just like, well, thank you for doing that in my life. <laughs> they often continue to be unruly or often continue to be faint-hearted or whatever the, con the concept might be. What's the third, the third admonition? Help the weak. The word there, weak, can mean both spiritually weak and physically weak. Let's think about the spiritual for just a second. Those who, uh, who consistently seem to fall into the same sin. And you're thinking, I told you this ten times. When are you ever going to learn? Or it could be those who are physically weak. Now, don't vote out loud on this one, but have you ever been to a public place? Uh, my dad, mom taught me to be a gentleman, right? So you open the door for an older couple. Or you're in line, and, I, and my dad is now 90. Okay, and here's about how fast my dad walks. All right? And you're trying to get somewhere. You're in a hurry. And this 90-year-old dude's in front of you thinking, come on, buddy, could you just hurry a little bit? He is right? hurrying. <laughs> he is hurrying. That's, that's not being patient. Okay? So, so help the weak. Okay. But then he says, over all that, whether, no, whatever category that person fits into, insubordinate, faint-hearted, weak, whatever they are, be patient with all people. Patient. Hmm. Patient with everybody. Okay, so we know we need it. It doesn't come naturally. Uh, it really helps or hinders our testimony. So what is it? Well, it's this idea of being slow to anger. I got a I got a long fuse, not a short, but a long fuse. Slow to get my thermometer to heat up to a to a boil. Okay, so how do I get this? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, here we go. Uh, turn your, if you don't mind, turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians, not Galatians, where we were for much of this series. Ephesians five. As you're going there, Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two, speaks a bit about the fruit of the Spirit. This idea of being patient or slow to anger. Well, the verses previous to the ones that we looked at uh, in the Fruit of the Spirit series, it talks about the, the deeds of the flesh. In other words, here's what happened. By the way, uh, Dr. Tillman did a great job last week. This idea of self-control when we have 
control of our spirit. He used the image which is used in the book of Proverbs about a, a city with no walls. That's what a person who has no self-control is like. Well, Paul writes to the church at Galatia, and the point is they're believers, but they're trying to live the Christian life in the flesh. It doesn't work. It won't work. It never has worked. It's only in the power of the Spirit that we can live the Christian life. That's the idea. So in Galatians 5, it says the fruit that the Spirit produces is X. But the deeds of the flesh are previous in the passage. So naturally, we tend to be angry. We just like, we quick fuse. But the Spirit produces patience in us. Okay. Well, you're in Ephesians 5, yes? Yes. Okay. So verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So let's just camp on that verse for just a second. What's the thing we're told not to do in verse 18? Don't get drunk with wine. Now, I know we're, not, we're a lot of Bible college students and professors and staff and potential students here. So I know nobody in this room has ever been drunk, but think about somebody you know who's been drunk, okay? Okay? And so he says, don't do that. Don't do that, right? Clear admonition, don't do that. But Paul's going to contrast that with something he wants us to do. So this idea of drunkenness, no, don't do that. But in contrast to that, there's a command to be filled with the Spirit. By the way, not a trick question. When you have a command, how many options do you have? Only one good one, but you got two options. Okay, I was never military, but trust me, in the military, a superior officer could give you a command. You can say, "No, stick that up your nose." Okay, that's a, not a good response, but you could do that, right? One good response, which is obedience. Okay, so negatively, don't get drunk. Now, the positive is going to be contrasted to that in some way. Right? Again, you don't know from personal experience, perhaps, but when a person is drunk, here's what's happened. They've consumed alcohol uh, to the point that it's in control of their system now. Yeah. They formerly had good speech, now they're slurred speech. They used to be real quiet, now they're the life of the party. Mm -hmm. Used to be a good driver, now they're a bad driver. Mm -hmm. We could go on, right? Yeah. Gotcha. That alcohol has control of them. And so he says, now, that's a negative. Here's the positive, and it's a command. Again, you can choose to obey or disobey. But in contrast to the negative, do this. Let the Spirit of God control you. By the way, in the Bible, the word fill can mean more of. Like you go out to eat to the restaurant, and you say to the waitress or waiter, I'd like some more iced tea. It's really, really bad theology to say, well, I need more of the Holy Spirit. Because when he came inside you, guess how much of him came inside of you? 100%. So the filling here doesn't mean more of. It means control. Like so-and-so is controlled by anger. Well, here, so-and-so is controlled by the Spirit. By the way, this control, this command, the way it's worded is go on being controlled. Okay? Now, again, nobody in here speaks from experience, but if a person were drunk, and let's suppose their goal for the rest of their life was to stay drunk. See, if you don't keep drinking, you sober up. You all know this, right? But if they wanted to stay drunk, what would they need to keep doing? Wonderful. Now, on the positive... We could say collective, well, we couldn't do it collective. Let's suppose everybody in the room said, I want to be controlled by the Spirit. Okay? Well, you choose that today, but guess what's going to happen this afternoon? There's that driver on Rayford Road. It's that wine at McDonald's. There's that. And so it's this day by day, moment by moment, say, okay, Lord, I want your Spirit to control me. Because in my flesh, here's what I'm going to do. I'll get angry. I'll honk the horn. I'll give a glare. I'll do all these things that I do in my flesh. I need you to control me. No, we're not going to go there, but if you want to kind of write this stuff down. In Colossians chapter 3, you'll, you have or you will learn this at CCBS. Paul wrote four prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Okay? So we're in Ephesians 5 for a second. Well, in Colossians 3, probably written within days or weeks of Ephesians, over there Paul doesn't say be filled with the Spirit. Here's what he says there. And you can look at it on the right behind Annette's desk back there down in the lobby. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. You're in the word all the time. Now, how do those two go together? Okay. By the way, if you took those two passages, it's like Paul did a copy and paste because he's going to say, here's the fruit in those passages. You're filled with the Spirit. You speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and you're thankful and all these things. Okay. Well, here's what I think. 
What's the thing that's most valuable to everybody in this room? Here's the thing that's most valuable to you. It's you. In other words, if you had a house fire, and somebody says, my neighbor knocks on the door, hey, Corber, your house is on fire. I'm going to survey the situation about that long, and if I have time to go in and get six or eight things, I will. But when I survey the situation, I think, man, it's a complete mess. Guess what, that's what's going to happen first. I'm getting out. <laughs> I can get a new gun. I can get a new couch. I can get a new TV. I can't get a new me. Okay, so back to Ephesians, the writer of uh, Paul says to people like us, the thing that you value most, you, you should relinquish control of that to the Spirit of God. And you're thinking, why would I give control to the thing I value the most to the Spirit? Because here's how we all think. I'm pretty good at managing my life. Would you all agree with that? Yes. Sure. We mess it up, but we think we're pretty good at it. Just like you think you're a good driver, but you've had four wrecks. I mean, I mean <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the way we are. But as you're in the Word, that's Colossians, the more you're in the Word, the more you realize, oh, here's the kind of being the Holy Spirit is. I'm much more likely to give control to, to somebody that I know from Scripture than somebody I don't know. Now, I'm going out on a limb here. Do you know what a bicycle built for two is? Yes. It's a bygone thing. For you're under 50, you don't even have an idea what that is, perhaps. <laughs> but as the term implies, two wheels but two seats, okay? There's a front seat and there's a back seat. Now, a little bit of a FYI if you don't know what I'm talking about. There's two sets of pedals and there's two handlebars. But the back set don't work. <laughs> They're just armrests. That's all they are. You're back there to help supply some power, but you don't get to steer anything. Right. Now, back in my day, it was not real common, but in our neighborhood, there'd be a family or two that had a bicycle built for two. Okay? And every now and then, we'd get access to that bicycle built for two. If the bicycle built for two is standing in front of you 10 feet, and you've got one friend, you and one other person, and you're going to go ride that thing, which seat are you going for? Absolutely, because you get the steer, right? And so here's the way we live life. We want the front seat. And so if we're really kind, we say to the Holy Spirit, we would never say it out loud because we know it's bad theology, but our life is this way. Hey, you can have the back seat. You supply the power, I'll figure out where we're going. Really bad move, okay? So here's what happens. You get lost and the Holy Spirit, if he were to speak audibly, says, how's that working for you, Corver? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? Now, let me be real honest with you. Because when, you're, when you let him have the front seat, that's control, you realize sometimes God doesn't take you where you want to go. Yeah. Like he takes you down Rayford Road and that person won't get off their phone. Somebody said it this way. Sometimes God's spirit takes us on, here's the critical phrase, delightful long cuts. <laughs> you know what a shortcut is, right? Sometimes he takes you on a long cut. It's like, Why do we, this, is, this is like further out of the way. And he's like, I got it. I know what I'm doing. All that to say, the fruit the Spirit of God wants to produce in your life is multifaceted, if you will. It's one fruit, singular. Think about an orange. You've got nine slices to it. And he's interested in producing patience in your life. And so here's how he does that. <laughs> and I hate to tell you this. I hate to even say it. He puts you in places where you learn, I need to develop it. Yes, oh, yes. but secondly, then he says, you know what? I'll help produce that in you. We don't have to, uh, I wish I could. No, he just produces patience in us as we give control of our lives to him. Here's what I'm convinced of. It. The other speakers who've gone before me this semester don't have to agree to any of this. I'm convinced that the, the fruit of the Spirit is a great illustration of Christ-likeness. Jesus had every one of those qualities yes. perfectly. And the Spirit of God, who is the third member of the Trinity, knows which one or ones you need most to have produced in your life. Yes. What's true for you may not be true. Maybe I'm pretty good at one and really, really bad at another. Well, guess what he's going to do? He's going to work on the one that you, one or ones you need most of. So perhaps, just perhaps, the Spirit of God <laughs> pointing his finger and says, you know what, you really need to work on patience. And I'll do that if and when you give control of your life to me. Mm -hmm. It's he, he that does it.
Let me give you one last thought. We're not going to go there in your Bible. And I think that's the how. Sometimes we need the why for the how. How does this patience get produced in us? It's when we realize, hey, I need to give control of my life to him. But that's the how. But what, the why? <laughs> Again, we're not going to go there. Matthew chapter 18, verses 26 to 29. Jesus told a story of a servant who had been forgiven much, but then went out and wouldn't forgive his fellow servant. You're familiar with the story. Let me read it to you. Matthew 18, 26 to 29. Jesus' words now. So the slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, that's his master that he owes this unpayable debt to, saying, and I have it in my notes in bold and underlined, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the master of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave his debt. The slave went out and found a fellow slave who owed him a owed him hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. It's the same word. And you know the rest of the story. Wouldn't forgive him. Here's my thought. The, the servant, the first servant, didn't consider the patience he'd received. He only considered the wrong he'd suffered. Where's my hundred bucks? Where's my money? He didn't remember <laughs> that unpayable amount that his master forgave him. And Jesus tells the story for a very clear reason. When you understand how patient God's been with you. Yes. Oh, wait, just a quick thought. I, I came to faith when I was six. I would not trade that journey for anything. But my experience has been this. Those of us who came to faith later in life often have a far greater appreciation for the patience of God than some of us who came early. Because when you live longer, obviously the Bible says very clearly we're all sinners, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But when you lived a little longer, maybe in your teens or 20s or 30s or beyond, then came to faith, you had more years to mess it up really royally, yes. right? Addicted to this and that relationship was busted and all that stuff. It's like, ah. And so your appreciation for the patience of God goes through the roof. Now, is he patient with everybody? It's just some of us have a better appreciation for his patience. And when we appreciate that and reflect on it, we realize, oh, <laughs> I really ought to be patient uh, with other people. That's the, maybe the, the why. What's God working on your life about uh, as a result of this sermon? My, con con I, my conviction is this, I need to be patient and I often am not. And the only way that's gonna happen in my life is by letting God, the Spirit, have control of my life. And that's a day by day, moment by moment decision. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your unbelievable, well, not unbelievable, but hard to fathom patience with us. Your patience with Bill Corver to not only lead him to salvation, but then for these many, many years to uh, keep working with me in spite of my many, many, uh, I'm sure, disappointments to you, disappointments and hurts to other people. Thank you for your patience. Pray that you would help us through the power of the indwelling Spirit of God develop that, uh, sp that patience as well so that people at the restaurant, people in traffic, people here at school, people at church, anywhere and everywhere we go, they may not know all the reasons, but they'll at least think this, that person is different. Uh, they're different than other people. They actually had patience, kindness to me. May we represent Jesus well in how we live. Part of that's going to include being patient, long-suffering as you were with us. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Corver is very good at self-revelation, isn't he? <laughs> and what... When I hear these stories of what he was like as a child, he had to have had pa parents who were very patient. And now he has to have a wife. She has to be very patient, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> and then he has us. <laughs> Um, 
But uh, wow, what a great message, so convicting, but so needed and necessary to kind of get us back in line and not be impatient with these things that aren't just really all that important. And uh, we do appreciate you, Miss Marcia. Thank you for being here. She's served along his side now here for almost 20 years, and we don't say thanks enough to her as well. Thursday of this week is National Day of Prayer, so dedicate time to praying for fellow students as well as our country. Um, our accrediting association, ABHE, is also dedicating the day in prayer so that all 155 plus schools and 60,000 plus students all gather together in prayer to remember the special needs of the day. And then this Saturday, from 10 a.m. to 4 a.m., we're all invited to the Dollingers, as you know. <laughs> 10 to 4 p.m., 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. <laughs> so, to correct then, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. this Saturday at the Dollingers, and there's a sign up sheet in the in the break room so sign up so we have an estimate of how many are coming just an estimate's all we need address is there we'll also get the information back out to you in an email again so it'll be a great time of fellowship for our whole school body to gather together and we appreciate the invitation and it's a really good time and a great setting a week from today will be our last chapel service for the semester. So we're praying for you students as you close out the term. But we look forward to a great time. One of your fellow students is going to be preaching coming out of Bible Expo 2 to be Brother John Lutz. And, and so naturally it can be kind of intimidating preaching in chapel. So remember him because we want to hear again from the word. And we appreciate it greatly. Uh, thank you again for your attendance. We're praying for you as you finish out this term. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer again, shall we? Father, as we uh, close out this time of, of dedicating ourselves to, to worshiping you and studying your word collectively, we, we walk out and refresh in our minds to consider this ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and how we yield ourselves afresh and anew to allow that full ongoing work to take place. Give us grace that we might be people characterized by patience and may it indeed um, affect our witness to the world as well as to elevate and improve um, our relationships one with another. Give us wisdom in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation and also uh, wisdom to um, um, allow the, your light to shine through us. And bless these students in a way that they can finish strong uh, for this semester and enable them to um, experience all that you would have for them in, in the journey of completing this time. We do thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good stuff. Good, good.